as the floor manager. That's awesome. Stage director. Yeah. When are we going to introduce the panelists for the first After my warm-up. Okay. <clears throat> Motion 103, the Zoomer, take one. cell phones, all pagers, all beepers, all blenders, tea kettles, whatever you have on you, please turn it off. Fully turn it off, otherwise it does interrupt, interfere with our equipment as well. If you have any problems, please either ask me or any of the gentlemen holding a camera, and we will assist you. With that said, they will be in your way. We do apologize. We are filming and TV show at the same time. So we do ask everybody to keep your eyes open, keep your head up, keep looking forward. You may get distracted and kind of start looking down, looking away on camera. That looks like you're sleeping. So we ask you to just keep your head up and look forward. <laughs> when you hear me clap, please feel free to clap. We're going to clap going into every commercial break and coming out of every single commercial break. If you feel like you want to clap or laugh at any point in time, please do so. Uh, what else? What else? What else? Now, I need to test your enthusiasm. On a count of three, I want you to yell, clap, scream, show me how excited you are. Ready? One, two, three! <laughs> I mean, so, that was good. <laughs> but I mean, it's Wednesday, and it's almost the weekend, and I do ask everybody to participate, and everybody to clap. You don't have to clap and see, you don't have to blend your hands together, but just clap a little bit, because we do have cameras everywhere. So there's always that one person that'll just be sitting there during an applause, and that ruins that entire shot. So one more time, it's Wednesday. One, two, three. <laughs> Sabrina Ghaffar Siddiqui. I'm a PhD candidate and researcher at McMaster University. I'm also the communications director for Canadian Council of Muslim Women in Toronto. Good morning, everybody. My name is Kofi Champong. I'm a lawyer by profession, currently non-practicing. Uh, I currently work as a senior policy advisor for a provincial cabinet minister here in Ontario. Uh, I'm also What's a that? convert to Islam. Uh, 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 six years ago, having converted to Islam. And um, that's pretty much it. Um, hi guys, my name is Aima, I'm a student at Ryerson University, second year politics and governance, and I'm a writer for Muslim Girl, which is an American Muslim organization that, con that portrays the narratives of Muslim women the way they want it to be portrayed, instead of being used as a scapegoat for the way that mainstream media uses it. Hi, my name is David Nitkin, I'm a professional ethicist. I'm here wearing my hat as uh, one of the founding members of Connect. Canadian Citizens for Charter Rights and Freedoms, and also for Canadians for the Rule of Law, and another organization for stop, called StopSponsoringHatred.com. When I'm not volunteering wearing any of those hats, I'm the president of an ethics consultancy called Ethics Scan Canada. Uh, hi, my name is Farzana Hassan. I'm an author of three books on uh, Islam uh, and women, and I'm a regular columnist for the Toronto Sun. And when I'm not writing, I'm also teaching music. Uh, I have a doctorate in ed education, and I teach music on the side. And I'm Anthony Fury. I'm a national columnist for the Post Media chain, 
of newspapers and I'm the morning show host on Sirius XM Canada heard uh, across the country and author of a new book on national security. And I'm Marissa Semkew. I'm your host for today. I'm also in my other role, Director of Policy and Government Relations for CARP. So thank you all for being here and we'll get started. What do Motion 103, Quebec's face covering ban and Massey College's decision to drop the title master have in common? We'll debate and discuss. That's coming up next on the Zoomer. Somebody's ringing. Hold on. Yeah, someone's phone ringing. Um, please, 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 please turn them all off now. If you need assistance in turning off your phones, please ask us. That officially has interrupted. <laughs> So we will come and assist you. Please turn off all cell phones. No, nope, we're not there yet. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Sir, do you need some help? Turn it off. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Um, it's like a dinner table discussion. So jump in. Just don't. Casual. Yep, cash. Don't wait for me to call on you. No it's, worries. It's like um, if you were a fly on the wall at a really contentious dinner table fight. <laughs> you know, that's what that was the idea for this show. <laughs> Confrontational. Yeah. Simple. Confrontational. Yeah. <laughs> What do Motion 103, Quebec's face covering ban, and Massey College's decision to drop the title master have in common? We'll debate and discuss. That's coming up next on The Zoomer. What do Motion 103, Quebec's face covering ban, and Massey College's decision to drop the title master have in common? We'll debate and discuss. That's coming up on the next episode of The Zoomer. Perfect. Yay. Okay, we're moving on. Stand by for the start of the show. Coming in with the assignment. Why? <laughs> Nasty. Stand by. What am I saying? Nine, eight, seven, six, six mile, four. What do Motion 103, Quebec's face covering ban, and Massey College's decision to drop the title Master have in common? We'll debate and discuss. That's coming up on the next episode of The Zoomer.
from the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village. The Zoomer with Marissa Semkew. Welcome to The Zoomer, I'm Marissa Semkew. Today we'll be discussing variations on the same topic, political correctness. In Canada, this movement has most recently expressed itself in Motion 103, in Quebec's face covering ban, and in Massey College's decision to drop the title master for head of college. It'll be a challenging show as each topic will likely incite strong reactions on both ends of the spectrum. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. M103 is a motion first introduced by Liberal MP Ikra Khalid. It calls on federal politicians to condemn systemic racism and religious discrimination. The motion became a matter of fierce debate as opponents claimed it needlessly singled out Islamophobia and attempts to thwart freedom of speech when it comes to criticizing extreme Islamic practices. I'm uh, very, very happy that this motion has passed and I'm really looking forward to the study now being conducted by the Standing Committee of Canadian Heritage. Here's the thing. The motion has no teeth. Still, critics worry it's a precursor to a bill which could very well lead to censorship and prosecution. The role of the state is not to defend the tenets of any particular faith. Rather, its role is to protect the right of the faithful to practice their faith, free of fear of reprisal, and to ensure that none of us are forced to worship that which we do not. M103 passed in March 2017. A committee was then tasked to study the issue and report back with recommendations. Will those recommendations be used to create legislation? Only time will tell. Farzana, why don't I start with you? So, as we just saw, it's a motion. It's not a law, which is nothing more than a proposal put forward by an MP in the House that says they want to do something. Okay, so the House decides it wants to combat Islamophobia. So what? What's the big deal? I, I have serious issues with the way the motion is worded. First of all, I have issues with the word Islamophobia. It's, it's all encompassing because it can also mean Islam, criticism of Islam, not just uh, of, of Muslims. So that in itself is problematic because I, in my opinion, no ideology should be beyond reproach uh, in that sense. And, and yes, I've heard this talk about the motion not being binding, but this isn't just about legalities. It's also about social censure. And, and what if I say this and, you know, my, my, my cousin will start saying, oh, you're an Islamophobe. And, you know, if you criticize polygamy or if you, or if you criticize the segregation of, or marginalization of Muslim women, um, which is a reality in many parts of the Islamic world and in this country. And, and I think as a Canadian, I should be allowed to criticize and call out Islamic fundamentalism or any other practice that I deem uh, not, not in sync with modern society or, or liberal values. So Kofi, how about that? Um, the fact that Islamophobia isn't defined, Farzana concerned that it'll expand to any type of criticism about Islam. Yeah. Is it a slippery slope? Yeah, I mean, I take your point, Farzana. I think, though, it strains a bit of credulity to think that government is trying to undermine constitutional rights to freedom of speech, academic freedoms, by putting forward a non-binding motion. I don't think anybody would sincerely think that that's the purpose of this. If you want to take an approach towards this particular motion that divorces it from the context within with we, which we live, a context within which Islamophobia is a reality, whether or not you want to characterize it or not as a, in, a, in a specific fashion, we all know what is meant by it. And it's not uncommon, in fact, for motions in legislation, or, or a motion or language in motion in a motion or legislation to be not entirely uh, specific about its meaning because things are, words come within a context, a defined meaning that people, people know. And uh, if we really want to get down to it, this is what the, the place of the courts are, really it might are. It be clear to you, but it's not clear to the public. <laughs> yeah. And the public is demanding an explanation. And yeah. there is intransigence on the part of the lib liberal uh, MPs too. Uh, in, including the Liberal MP, Ikra Khalid, who actually introduced the motion, yeah. why is she so stubborn about defining the word clearly for, 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 the, for the Conservative would, MPs would in it this matter? Would it extend to any type of criticism about Islam? I don't think anybody... Oh, absolutely. I don't think anybody, absolutely. anybody it would reasonably thinks that. It would include criticism of Islam. It would include criticism of Islamic practice. That's a, that's a disingenuous uh, uh, articulation. I don't think so. Let's How be honest is it here. disingenuous? To suggest that the, a motion, which is meant to, to do what? acknowledges the zeitgeist or the culture within which Muslims are living now. Every day that there's an event that occurs in the world, it could be anywhere in the world, that has some kind of Muslim person associated with it, there's a backlash that Muslims feel. 
uh, there's a reality that Muslims have to now contend with. And this motion, can, let me finish, yeah. this motion is an attempt to recognize that and, 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 and uh, call it what it is. It comes on the heels of somebody uh, going into a mosque in Quebec and murdering six Muslims. For, the, for, for what reason? Other than the fact that people's words and actions and articulations have created a, seg a culture within which Islamophobia has been rife. But Sabrina, okay, it, the motion does single out Islamophobia, though it's meant to be a, a ban against any sort of religious discrimination. In Texas, we just saw a, whole, a Christian church, a bunch of folks killed in a Christian church. Why not speak about the fact that Christians are being persecuted too? Why single out Islamophobia? When you have facts coming out, from Stats Canada showing a 253% increase in hate crimes against Muslims. I think that is evidence enough that the Muslim community is being targeted. But you're justifying it. I mean, Christians actually are the more perse most persecuted group in the world. In Canada, by the numbers. Uh, according to Stats Can, uh, the Jewish community is more targeted than the Muslim community. However, the reason why a study like this is very important, being a researcher in this area, I can tell you that the research that we have right now, the numbers that we have right now are not accurate. Uh, the numbers that we have in terms of the hate crimes that exist are far less than what the reality is because there is a lot of underreporting happening. There are certain segments of the Muslim community, refugees, new immigrants, who do not report hate crimes. They are more likely to be targeted, but less likely to report. So, an you know, a research like this is even more important so that we can get a better understanding of how bad the problem is. You know, Kofi said something very interesting where you said we should look around the world at people's experiences. And certainly we'll see that Muslim people are victims of assaults and extremism all across the world, maybe disproportionately so, also mm -hmm. victims of radical Islamic terrorism. But I think we also need to look at Muslim opinion around the world and talk about the general issue of Islamophobia and how it's looked at around the world. You said that it's pretty clear what it means to everyone. I don't think that's true at all. When you actually look at how Islamophobia laws have been brought out in other countries in the world, Pakistan and so forth, they actually have views of Islamophobia that do broaden to include people who simply criticize the religion. And there are people incarcerated, dozens of people in Pakistan right now that's who are incarcerated. That's not Islamophobia, that's a blasphemy. That. That's, yeah. And they use the word Islamophobia interchangeably. No, go and look at, go and they, listen to how President Erdogan, for instance, talks about it. He's, he's pushing Pakistani. to broaden the concept. He's I'm aware. Well, there you go. It's an it's even bigger problem. Pakistan, so, Pakistan but, but, Turkey, that, Indonesia. Islam. You're it's conflating many countries. Islamophobia with blasphemy. They conflate and those issues. Intellectually, it's conflated in the way they talk about it. But we need to understand that these, the topic that we're talking about, the topics we're talking about are in Canada. Yes, we need to Canada talk about it in the context of... From all around the world, and we have tens of thousands of people coming to Canada every year who have a different view of what Islamophobia might mean. And they're acclimatized to thinking it means, yeah, we should actually incarcerate people for blaspheming and saying things that we say are Islamophobic. It's the way they talk. And I think it's incumbent upon us to really clarify it to those newcomers. Sorry, guys, we're actually not doing that. So I think it's way. been made very clear by now that Islamophobia is an irrational fear of Muslims. And so Farzana has written that's not true. And Farzana has written that uh, uh, Islamophobia doesn't exist in Canada. Can you explain well, your position? I, I'm, I, I don't have issues with doing research about anti Muslim crimes or anti Muslim bigotry. I don't have issues with that. However, it's the wor wording of, of, of this motion that has caused me anxiety. I consider it an unreasonable demand. I also consider it unpatriotic because I think this is a very, very harsh judgment on Canada's laws and society. To say that there is systemic, systemic racism or systemic discrimination against Muslims is the very narrative that feeds right into the jihadi mindset because it tends to be overblown. You're saying that these crimes are underreported. Maybe they are, but they're underreported in every single community. It's not just Muslims. You know, there are crimes underreported in the Jewish community as well. In, in, in uh, I'll give community. you a little bit of context and of that. Uh, in Canada, we have 3.2% Muslims, 1% Jews. 88% of Muslims in Canada are racialized compared to 2% of Jews who are racialized. Now that says a lot about the stats and uh, when it comes to hate crime, sorry, uh, um, okay. <laughs> I just wanna explain that 
when a Muslim person experiences discrimination, oftentimes because of people like yourself who question Islamophobia, you know, the existence of it, they would probably much rather report their experience as racism as opposed to an anti-Muslim discrimination. That skews the results. So that's why we don't, so the fact that we've got this intersection of race and religion, that, that plays a big part. David? Let me offer a perspective here. I'm the chair of the Muslim Jewish Dialogue. We have been meeting over years, groups of adults and groups of high school students. And the overwhelming expression of opinion on the part of the Muslims who participate in the Muslim Jewish Dialogue is we fear Islamophobia. The word means something to us. We fled the concept of haram. We fled the concept of blasphemy law in our home country. How could you Canadians be so stupid as allow a bill like this to come forward? We are secular Muslims. We are the majority. We fear we're going to be the first to be threatened by this bill becoming law. What a so if it becomes law, the, it, the Muslims that I'm speaking to and listening to are very, very clear. They understand that Islamophobia has a history. It's tied in with the Muslim Brotherhood. It was created in the 1930s. It finds expression in the United Nations Resolution 1618, which will be incumbent upon Canada and which will make any comment or criticism of Islam to be mentally deranged, to be racist, to be irrational. So you're and saying that, and that is dangerous because there is reason to fear elements in Islam. So you're and saying to be able to express that and be told that you can't express it is exactly what this motion is about. And, 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 and so, which begs the question, can I say, if I wanted to, can I say that I think Islam is a stupid backwards religion? You're, you're entitled to say that, absolutely. I don't think that, uh, I, you're, you're entitled to say that we live in a free democratic society. And you're also entitled to pull <laughs> a human rights complaint against her for that reason, and you might actually prevail, which I think is what's wrong with the culture that this country's heading in. And Farzana made that point that there are cultural problems with this. Yeah, it no, I mean, just legalities. could be censured for it, saying It that. isn't no. just legalities. It's not I'm just a, the fact that it's not legal. Why don't we bring you in here? I'm just like thinking about the whole issue right now. You guys keep on saying that Islamophobia is basically only going to target secular Muslims. Right, and they're going to be saying that it's going to infringe their right to freedom of speech. It's not going to infringe their right to freedom of speech. They can criticize Islam any which way they want. Right? I'm totally for that. Right? But when they start criticizing a woman's right to choose the niqab, or when they start criticizing someone's um, autonomy right, to practice their religion freely in the country, that's what I would say is Islamophobia. And on that's that part of Islamic practice, in, in some groups at least. So that would be considered cr criticizing Islam, at least a brand of Islam. Um, yeah. But would you criticize the yarmulke? That's part of the Jewish religion now, isn't it? Right? It's an article of their faith. This is an article of their faith. Two, two very different subjects, and we will touch on them when we come back. So when we come back, we'll debate Quebec's law banning the niqab and burqa while receiving public services. That's next. What a, what a, what a very interesting conversation. Yeah, right? Yes, yes. Great, guys. Kofi, which minister are you with? So I work for uh, Tracy McCharles. She's the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. Not, uh, yeah. Tracy I'm not speaking on behalf of Tracy. I understand. No, no, understood. <laughs> understood. <laughs> the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which has 54 Muslim countries, oh my gosh, has a very yes. clear definition Sorry. of what Islam it's it's is. Mm -hmm. And it is not free speech. What is it? Uh, the <laughs> definition <laughs> is that an irrational oh, it's, it's fear of or criticism of Islam or the Prophet Muhammad must be criminalized, is haram. And that is the ubiquitous practice among the five dozen countries that have a very different definition of Islamophobia than the one that you think is represented by this motion. I just want to say that um, I actually work closely with the Student Supporting Israel organization at Ryerson, yeah. and I'm friends with the president, Tamar Jaffronians, and we actually had a, a really good debate about this, right? Um, she's an orthodox... Stand by, coming Sorry. in, 45 seconds to the floor. Yeah. 
seconds. This is like a really long 30 seconds. Welcome back. The province of Quebec recently passed a controversial bill which requires people to uncover their face to receive provincial and municipal government services like riding the bus. Quebec's justice minister said the law applies when it's required for communication, identification, or security reasons. Opponents have accused the province of targeting Muslim women who wear a niqab or a burqa, and civil liberties advocates have since launched a legal challenge over the constitutionality of the ban, arguing it, quote, directly infringes on the freedom of religion of individuals. Individuals. Before we jump in, here's Barbara Kay at this year's Idea City Conference talking about the origin of Muslim head coverings. The hijab came into common usage only after 1979 and the Iranian Revolution. By 1982, it was um, uh, a rule was passed in Iran that all girls over the age of six, regardless of faith, had to wear the hijab. As you see, uh, before 1970, Muslim women uh, were very confident in their Muslimhood, in their, uh, their allegiance to Islam, uh, but they looked like we look. After 1970, it was quite different. We have women in Afghanistan who have been put into body bags, and the hijab in Iran became a symbol of militant Islam, Islamism. Uh, so this is a symbol of political Islam whose aim is to uh, uh, is triumphalist and which is extremely hostile to the West. This woman says she's supporting women's rights uh, by endorsing. She's endorsing full cover and she thinks she's doing something good for women who wear uh, full cover. But most of the women wearing full cover uh, are dying to get out of it. And so this woman is not helping her. Uh, she is enabling. She is enabling the oppression of women. So Barbara's point is this isn't really a straightforward issue of religious accommodation, that there is no religious obligation to wear a full face covering and that it's actually a regional custom. And that's important because that's what the op opponents of the law point to, that this is a violation of freedom of religion. So who's right? Ima. I'm Muslim, visibly Muslim. I'm wearing the niqab, right? I'm wearing the hijab. Um, I believe it's a part of my faith, which is Islam, right? And it's dictated in the Quran, right, for women to cover themselves in a modest way. Now, not all Muslim do, like Muslims do it, like Farzana Hassan here, um, but we have the choice to adorn it the way we want to. Now, this bill is targeting less than 3% of the population, and it states that for us to access public services, we have to show our face. I already do that when I go to um, Health Canada, right? When I'm writing my exam at Ryerson University, I take off my niqab, show it to the TA, right? This is my face, this is Aima, right? Give them my card, and they'll verify that it's me, right? And it's usually a woman, right? They accommodate me. We're already... Um, what do you call, listening to what the laws of the country are saying, to show our face when necessary. When I go on the bus, right, I have um, a Metro Pass, right, with the company's, uh, like, an identif identification card, and they check it, right, and they verify it, and they're like, okay, yeah, you're good to go. We already do all those things, so why do they have to say it and say that, oh, it's for religious neutrality, right, it's for the state, uh, for the state to be secular, when all Muslims, most Nagabi Muslims, we already abide by the laws of the country, right, they just want to get those cheap votes and make sure, like, oh, this party is against Nagab, right, Muslims, who are wear niqab are backwards, or Muslims who wear niqab um, don't, um, what do you call, can't be assimilated into the fabric of, of our society, but I'm going to university, right? I'm getting my education, I go to work, right? I write for a different um, blog, so I'm pretty active within the community. The niqab doesn't inhibit me from that. So you do it anyway? Yeah, I do it anyway. Uh, so what's so, the point of the law? <laughs> yeah. So, but, but then to that point, it's not necessarily wrong, it's just mm -hmm. consistent with what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but... What's wrong with the, with, the, with the bill then? Why target? <laughs> Why put them on the spotlight They're not targeted. like that? The, the, it's a spotlight being placed on an already stigmatized group. Yeah, are, are, we, are we here to there pretend? Are, are we here to pretend masks, that we don't know uh, who are what's, also what's, being what's happening from this. politically here? We all know that this is a this is a, a grab at votes yeah. in a in a in a society in a As culture. As if that it would be the first time politicians no, do something to let, grab let, votes. Then let's, then let's admit that. 
Let's what admit that. What is wrong with women identifying themselves in public places? Nobody is wrong with that. In, I we, we live, it. We live in a liberal democracy. Why because it validates, it, validates, it validates people to it take doesn't. the... No, no. It's, it's listen, targeting. It's not targeting. Are you women in the cup? Are you women in the cup? I'm the one who has to deal with it, right? People would get feel like they're validated in their actions to impose that law on us, right? For example, if you go on the bus, right, and the bus driver doesn't ask for our identification, some guy or the citizen would take it into their own hands to say, rip my niqab off or rip my hijab off. As we said, 250%. Well, that would be assault if they physically... That, they would do that, but then they would be validated saying that, oh, I want to see her face. She has to identify herself uh, because she's on the bus or she's getting her health services, right? Why can't she identify me uh, to me as a man? Why, can't she, why does she need a woman to do it, right? But in, um, within like the Islamic context, we're already told to comply with the security uh, reasons for us to take off the niqab. I'm not going to inhibit uh, a security officer and make it hard on myself, go to jail just because I refuse to take the niqab off. I'll take it off, right? You said this targets 3% of the population, pointing out there 3% yeah. of, of, of the Canadian population yeah. is Muslim, but that's not true. It targets 3% of that 3%. We know that only about 3% of Muslim women actually wear the niqab, and then about, about 45% 40, the the wear the hijab. And then 50% of other Muslim don't wear the uh, Muslim women don't wear the hijab. And you pointed out, let's talk about the elephant in the room about the political element. Well, I agree with you there from another angle. Mm -hmm. the, the the niqab is a very extremist gar garment around the world. There is only mm -hmm. the most orthodox sects, the Wahhabists and the Salafists, who wear those garments. Mm -hmm. So we're well, having I'm this whole conversation. Know. We're having this whole conversation, sort of ignoring that fact that this is a signifier wearing the niqab it denotes much more radical views that it should be socially acceptable Why would you to say condemn it's an and, and plus it's a security it's an risk now because our identity is our face why is it an extra, why is it Let a me finish. Because the niqab is associated with the Wahhabi because, 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 because the niqab is associated with oppression. It's, 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 it's steeped in patriarchy. It's, it's a symbol of patriarchy. It's a symbol of Islamism. Patriarchy is removing women's clothing okay, as well so as one at a time. It on one that at a time. Too, but so, so is this. This we is have to accept oppression as one manifestation of patriarchy. That's patriarchy as well. It's not. It's this. This particular garb is rooted in patriarchal traditions. It's rooted in patriarchy. Patriarchy. It's rooted in patriarchal interpretations of Islam. In and your the Quran. point of view. Oh, but in, 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 point in, in, in of the view. this is the consensus. It's not my point of view. The, the consensus is that women can be. Where? Can, the the mullahs in Saudi Arabia. The, the so the mullahs have authority over the the Islamic Saudi Arabia. scholars that women don't need yeah. to cover their face. This is a consensus of orthodox Islamic scholars. It's not my opinion. So okay. hold on. So I just want I just want to point something out because this is. Um, this, this goes right to the heart of what we want to be in Canada. We can talk about Saudi Arabia. We can talk about Pakistan. We're, we're talking about Canada, the Canadian context. If a woman chooses to cover her face for sincerely held religious reasons, and as long as those reasons don't infringe on... on they do. Hold on, hold on, hold on. As long as those, re those reasons don't infringe on other people's rights in a way that is unjustifiable in a free and democratic society, we have a duty to accommodate. That's what our courts have said around religious rights. When, when politicians... But a duty of wait, can, can I, wait, let me, let me finish. Let me finish. Let, 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 let me finish. someone is let a me, robber wearing me, a niqab, let me, if let me, someone yeah, is a terrorist exactly. wearing a niqab, that, is that person one of them? One at a time. Let's how many, how, many, how, many, how, many, how many... How often are people... How often are people... One at a time. How often are people... I would like to specifically on that because I actually researched it. Hang tight. Let Kofi finish his thought. You know, this is a this is a kind of absurd claim. I wish people would be more honest. You don't like the cob. It doesn't. You yeah. don't. You feel viscerally. You don't like it. It doesn't look good. Don't manufacture reasons for it. Just say you don't like it. I don't like the way it looks on you. I don't the like the way. Why? I don't like the way what, you it identifies you. Not hold on, hold on. Values is the reason why someone Canadian might not values, like it. sir. Canadian yes. values, sir, are a constantly fluidly changing thing. As I and know. ultimately, a, a, a thing that re reflects and represents the diversity of Canada. The Constitution is to be interpreted in a way that that accords with our multicultural society. This is multiculturalism. Like it or not, that's the con Canada that we have chosen to live in. It's an and abuse of multiculturalism. Okay, that's it's your that's your that's your opinion. And you know what? We have to be very is careful. The majority of we got to be, we have to be very Canada careful because values are changing. Be careful because dem more democracy and more democracy are is upheld and by liberal individual rights. That All of us recognize that some people, you you Farzana, are allowed to walk around, believe be a Muslim. I'm not going to question that. Okay, you're allowed to walk around, be a Muslim. I'm not going to question that. Okay, David, next. What is wrong with that? <laughs> our identity is our face. We That's are changing. Just let him finish. We, let him no, finish. it's it's not. It's not. And I, so I have I have daughters, and 
when one of them proposed to have an, a nose ring, that was a problem for me. So what? That's your problem. I, well, yes, it's my problem. I, that's the point. A woman's right also has to take into account the impact that she has on others. And male or female, including men Sounds that like use the niqab... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hang tight. Continue, go ahead. Men that use the niqab to perpetrate acts of violence uh, because they would be protected uh, is a problem. And there are increasing cases of women being diagnosed with having skin problems, with having health conditions that are directly the result of wearing full cover face. Okay, so Alec, I'm pretty flawless under this niqab, right? I don't have no skin problems. Um, if anything, <laughs> if you... See? Uh, sure, I'll show it to you in the green room. Um, but I just want to say that if um, there's many people, like doctors, they wear, they're wearing health masks up till here anyways, right? They don't have no problems. They change it. I wash my niqab. If you don't wash your niqab, obviously you're going to get skin problems, okay? That's a, like, that's a has like, issue with hygiene. When it comes to security issues and the propaganda around niqab, I just want to say that's the media's fault, ultimately, okay? We could say the same thing about heels and makeup. They're, they're oppressive to women, right? Just recently, I believe in British Columbia, they banned people from wearing the heels within companies, okay? So that's oppressive. You could say that's part of the patriarchal system. Or you could say that corsets and bras are part of the patriarchal system. Why do women have to constrain their bodies uh, so that men don't get sexually aroused, right? You're telling women to change their behavior so that men can behave differently. When men have to lower their gaze, when men have to change their behavior, they're the perps. Right, not the women who are wearing or wearing different types of clothing. I, I think Anthony the media has work. actually downplayed the security issues because you look around the world and you realize that there are niqab bans uh, all across mm -hmm. the the Middle East, all across Africa, and in Europe, which which higher courts have actually upheld, by the way. And we don't talk about why those there are those security concerns. I, I just want to say one more thing, though, Kofi. When you mentioned about forget about what's going on in Saudi Arabia, let's talk about here in Canada. I don't buy that because right now in Peterborough, there's a gentleman who's trying to get these white supremacist rallies going on. But then he says, "Oh no, it's not really white supremacy." He has a giant swastika tattoo on his chest. He's like, "Oh, don't worry, I just did that when I was young and idealist." I'm like, "Sorry, buddy." I'm not buying it. I know what they do down south. I know what they did decades ago in those Klan rallies. You've got this. I'm not buying it. Just like I will not differentiate between the extremist Wahhabist niqab extremism going on there and when it's brought here. You can't distinguish the two. There are origins. There are connections. Okay, okay. Well, well, when we co okay, when we come back. Did Massey College cave to political pressure? We'll discuss that next. We, this will all come back up, by the way, in discussion a little bit later in the show. Because oh. there, we'll we'll have questions from the audience. Um, We're not just going to talk about tax policy. <laughs> well, I'd love to talk about pension protection, which is like really the sexiest issue ever right now. Are we taking questions from yes. the audience? Not next. First, we'll talk about uh, Massey for a few segments, and we'll go. I don't have much of an opinion on that. Okay. No, no, no. coming There's barely any time for anyone to ever say anything anyway. I know. I want to say so much about this. We can, we'll circle back to it in segment four because we're going to talk about what. Would you mind to me? Yeah. Sure. I really wonder sometimes, like, is it is it kind of like, are you being, are you sort well, of just taking the position that you feel like you're supposed to take on, on, this, on the right or something like that? Or do you sincerely She's say that? She's not a right winger. I don't, we I disagree on many. I'm more sure. conservative. I know she doesn't agree with me on this. I say this for the case. I say this for the case. I'm not a However, however, I feel that. Hey, Dom. You can tell Mary. Job well done. I want to know sort of the philosophy around Yeah, good. In my ear, in my ear, my producer's being like, control the panel. <laughs> That's funny. Hey, sit down. What's happening? Right 
I didn't get through any of the questions I wanted to ask in that last segment. Um, Here at Massey College, we're getting reaction to the controversy that resulted in the resignation of Professor Michael Maris and changing the use of the title master as head of the school after Maris made a slavery-related remark to a black student. The incident happened at lunch. The professor was sitting with three junior fellows when the master of the college joined them. Maris turned to the student and remarked, you know this is your master, eh? Do you feel the lash? In a place where I, I would feel... <sighs> Like, I, I would want to be welcomed, you know, and if I'm being targeted because of the color of my skin or whatever social identifier that pointed me out to this, this person, um, yeah, it would, it would definitely leave me upset and angry. Do you recall the incident happening? Very clearly. Yeah? And what were, what were your thoughts at that moment? My thoughts were that um, the um, professor who used the term master and asked the question, have you felt the lash, I think didn't understand how, har how ha harmful and hurtful that would be to um, um, members of the college who happen to be people of color, and I think it was a profound mistake. With all the stuff in the States and all these protests that are going on, uh, I should say something like that. It's a thing that's very sensitive at the moment and probably shouldn't have been said at all or even thought of. Have you changed your title in the meantime? Yeah, when the event took place and the college issued an apology, I set aside the title master pending the report of the task force uh, on what the title should be going forward. So now I'm being referred to as head of college and it works just fine. If it makes you that uncomfortable, then it shouldn't be part of like the school's vocabulary as it were. I think it was an unfortunate situation where a, a smart and accomplished person said something incorrectly, inappropriately, regretted it immediately, mm -hmm. uh, but I think the reaction has been, uh, has been overblown. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Michael Maris said this in an interview uh, recently. He said, where was the due process? Where was the effort to hear me out? Where was the effort to relate to 30 years of scholarship that have a lot to do with human rights? There is something cruel and reckless about this campaign. He went on to say, I was so sorry for having wounded someone, but nothing availed. So Anthony, I'll start with you. This was a man who 30 years of um, devoted, a devoted scholar for 30 years, he was awarded the Order of Canada in 2008. He was pushed out by the college. Did the punishment fit the crime? And I think that's the integral question here to ask. I mean, the Massey College is center of higher learning where you should be judged for the quality of your ideas, not the, the color of your skin. We don't even need to be speaking to people in that regard. It's just kind of a silly thing to do. And he shouldn't have made that remark. And the fact that he probably cringed, I guess, right after he said it and said he regretted it is the right response to have. There's a question of disproportionality in terms of response. So changing the title at Massey College, uh, getting rid of the guy, I mean, are people people so hurt that this is irreconcilable and we can't come together as a community again after it. Uh, recently, a woman was fired for giving the middle finger to Donald Trump's motorcade. And what, whatever you think about the president, you like him, you don't like him again. There's a bit of a question of disproportionality. We get these stories and they become flashpoints mm -hmm. and we see how we can kind of run them into the ground with reactions. So should he have said that line? No way. Should he have apologized? Absolutely. Did we go too far in the reaction? Did they go too far? I, I, I think so. You know, we talk about snowflake generation. Let's, let's find ways to come together over this. Hugh Siegel, the headmaster, said, of course, that uh, he wasn't fired. He resigned, though it's pretty clear he was pushed out. There was a petition signed by 200 faculty members calling for his re resignation with a, a, a pretty threatening uh, a note attached to it, um, basically reading... I can't find it at the moment, but I'll, I'll find it after. <laughs> uh, this petition pushing him out, which is to say, um, do you think the punishment fit the crime? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, it's unfortunate. Obviously, um, you know, uh, you know I, I, I have to take people at their word uh, when they say that they, 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 they apologize. Everybody makes mistakes. But at the same time, we do have to hold people accountable, particularly people who are put in positions where they are in charge of educating the next generation of leaders, of thought leaders, of thinkers, uh, people who don't understand the power of words and how that can evoke all kinds of realities for people. 
So I mean, I, I take the point that yes, I mean, uh, people do make mistakes. Uh, and of course, there's going to be a, 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 a campaign launched because that school is, is setting a standard for other, other institutions across the board. That school has to represent other, uh, other people's views and experiences in life. And of course, other faculty and, and students are going to feel aggrieved by this type of comment coming from a, a person in, in a very senior role. Now, the petition, as I... The petition signed by 200 faculty members read this. In our eyes, the very legitimacy of Massey College hinges on the effectiveness of your response to this incident. Uh, and it, so it, it, it went on. So not only, though, was, was Mr. Morris pushed out, um, the school then decides to drop the title of master. Massey College is not the first institution uh, of higher learning to do this. Mm -hmm. Harvard, Yale, Princeton have now done it. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, come on. Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard, I hear this a lot. Uh, you know, you know, there, there are, there are narratives that are part and parcel of, of this event. So in Harvard and Yale, uh, these are these are schools that have historically um, uh, sort of racist past and associations that are difficult for a new brand of students. The reality is all these conversations, what ties them together is that you're dealing with a, a more diverse institution. University of Toronto was a very white space uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Now you're talking about a very different institution with very people with, from, come from diverse backgrounds and diverse histories. Naturally, the school's gonna have to change uh, and, and its institutions are gonna have to reflect that. Well, what will that accomplish? I mean, and then where do you stop? I hold an MA, a, a, master, a, a master of administration from, from NYU, but there's a, there are, the term master holds numerous different meanings. Where do you stop then? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's fair. I mean, this is, a, this is a common sort of refrain to, to a criticism. It's a slippery slope. If, if, we, if we drop master in this particular context, then who knows, maybe we'll have to drop master. I don't think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a type of a, a level of reasoning that I think uh, but where is... But down the slope? Because I could see us having a debate panel, you know, a few years ago where Morris was let go, and then I had said, well, what next? Are we going to get rid of the term master? Because even though it has nothing to do with it, you know, people would say, oh, it triggers. And then, you, you know, people say, no, drop that slippery slope argument. I mean, we're already going down the slope. I'm That's a, what this is. I'm a master of cooking, uh, a master of craft, a master of, a, sure, you know, wh where do you stop? Well, w what do the following words have in common? Not only master, but what about lawyer? What about native? What about immigrant? What about colonial? What about boy? What about Jew? What about Indian? They're all the same, and we need to understand that university spaces have to be about understanding the difference between ethics and morality. All of those words are not about ethics. They're not about right and wrong. They are changing cultural definitions of what is right and appropriate. So we change definitions of homosexuality. We change definitions of premarital sex. We change definitions about the appropriateness of master as a word. We have to be very, very careful in recognizing two things. Number one, words that were appropriate at one point in time may be less appropriate at another point in time. And number two, what's sacrosanct? What word sooner <coughs> or later will also not come into question? And so what we face is the larger issue for me, which isn't one person's clumsy attempt at humor. He's acknowledged that but rather are universities going to be closed-minded spaces? Are we going to try and turn universities into conflict-free zones? And that's what I'm hearing. I'm hearing from the students that I teach, it's politically incorrect to be able to speak. We really are not about a free speech environment at this university, and that as an ethicist caused me concern. Okay, so you guys mentioned, you know, having a master of education, being a master of cooking. Now, what we need to remember here is that the master of the college, he, he's in a position of power, privilege, and in charge of other human beings, not inanimate things, not cooking or education or papers, other human beings. So in that context, for that role, that word doesn't work because we're talking about human beings. And the fact that he was in a position of authority and power over, like Kofi said, a diverse body of students. That's so not, that's not actually that true. Are, are denoting, you know, different power lines, chief executive officer, sergeant, uh, you know, and corporal. The origin, I, I mean, the, prime minister means you're prime, you're above the And the, the origin rest of, of the term is rooted in master of one's craft. Not in, in master, not in this master-slave inference. Of course, that's not what it was meant. There are multiple connotations here, but that's not what that was meant to be. 
And Kofi pointed out that the, the student body makeup is changing, and you know, I see that. I went to U of T 10 years ago and so forth, and the next master of Massey College or subsequent two or three might be, it might be a female, might be a Muslim scholar, might be, you know, any background and so forth. So I think that kind of changes almost the, the stereotype, and wouldn't that kind of even change the way we look at the word but to, but to David's point you know this is a this is a, this is a symptomatic of a larger problem the Toronto District School Board recently dropped the title chief um, for fear that it was uh, offensive to indigenous peoples so we're seeing academia our institutions go down this road and at a certain point someone has to finally say stop this is crazy. Why, why does someone does have it, to... Oh, so go ahead. Go ahead. I, was gonna say, I mean, really, is it that problematic, though? Like, if you're changing words to accommodate a very different makeup of society, is it really that difficult? I if mean, you had more words master, and you get hundreds get of them and of dozens, chief, yeah, like, it is. I mean, really... I mean, in the, if you compare the problems you may face or we may face because of changing words on paper compared to the feelings and experiences of the people who were subjected to that in that situation, very minor compared to what those people may be Change feeling. Change Islamophobia in that motion. I just uh, want to say Completely one different, thing. Uh, uh, not related. Not related. Yeah. Yeah. You brought, <laughs> brought up the topic, <laughs> you the topic of um, triggers and snowflakes, etc. Right. I just want to say, as a person, as we are a panel of people of color, that just because you've been desensitized to the experiences that we have doesn't mean that we are sensitive to that. What we're trying to say is that those words, when you're used in that context, can be abused. And they have been abused, as seen with this case, right? As a black person, you can speak. I'm not going to speak for you, but um, having to live with that constant reminder that it's okay for people to say those certain things to you and then say that that's under the freedom of speech. It's not under the Nobody's freedom of speech. Nobody's saying it's okay to be racist towards others. People are just saying when it comes to the word master, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, I mean, the barometer the, the, of offense is continually dropping, and that's what makes us have to reform all these different rules and institutions. And eventually, we have to stand up to say, no, let's not let the barometer of offense keep Society dropping. Let's just be resilient yeah. altogether as a community. OK, hold that thought. We'll be right back. <laughs> No, 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 I understand why. The Muslims, I understand that. I think that's a very good institution. And 30 I, I, seconds to the floor, 30 seconds. And I'd be very supportive of that. What I mean is, why would you take secular Muslims and, 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 uh, and have a conversation with them? You're we, we don't take secular Muslims. Anybody who chooses to participate. Well, you mentioned that they were secular Muslims. So your organization Muslims. attracts the majority of the Jews and the majority of the Muslims turned out to be okay. Okay. So your organization is not representative. Okay. Okay. okay, I'm going to you first. In five, <laughs> Welcome back. We've been talking about an incident on the campus of Massey College, which led to a professor resigning and the institution dropping the title of master as its leader and replacing it with head of school. Now, Sabrina, you were just saying something before the break. Yeah, I had a lot more like passion before the break, but um, you use the word resilience, which I have a problem with. I actually wrote a piece on that recently. That you know, resilience means probably something very different to you than it does to someone like me. Now, I have had to show a lot of resilience in higher education, my education process, because I have faced a lot of discrimination, sexism, um, you know, discrimination towards me in terms of my race, my uh, gender, my religion. And I can tell you, it's not fun to be resilient. I don't want to be resilient. I don't want to have to be resilient in the face of these things. I would like my daughter to not have to be resilient. I would like to change the dialogue and the narrative so that resilience isn't something that's just expected from people in minority. You know, in the minor you. I have done a study of lack responses to racism in Canada. Uh, in the 19th century it was part of my master's thesis and their resilience was the redeeming factor that brought meaning and life to blacks who were fighting against oppression fighting against slavery and so your opinion is your own which I respect but let's understand that minority groups can profit from resilience can profit from developing their own sense of confidence and pride and becoming part of the Canadian mosaic so slavery was then kind of good for them, like no. to be resilient your, in the face your, of discrimination? Your interpretation, of, your, your interpretation of what I said, no. I, I, I want to give you an example. So I, I went to a high school here in Toronto called Runnymede. Uh, some of you might know Runnymede. It used to be a very good basketball school. Uh, um, we used to be called the Runnymede Redmen. 
uh, initially when I first went to the school. Later on, they changed the name of the school to the Runnymede Ravens because Redmen, well, you know, it, it evokes a kind of pejorative type of thinking about Aboriginal and First Nations people. Now, a person might say, oh, these guys are too sensitive and what's wrong with using saying red men and whatnot, but what, do you, what did I get from that as a, as a high school student? I learned that words matter. I learned that how I think about people and what I call them might frame the way I deal with them and might frame the way I deal with other people. Now, of course, if you're the dominant majority in society, which the vast majority of uh, Canadians are, you know, and uh, come from a particular sort of white Anglo-Saxon sort of background, French-Canadian background, this isn't something that you have to worry about. You don't contend with this. You don't wake up in the morning thinking about how words are, used, are being used in that particular way. Now, it's kind of, it's now as, as other communities in this, in this society are sort of getting, getting uh, you know, more settled and, and their, their children are growing up and they're asserting themselves and saying, I don't like when you call me that. This becomes an issue of, oh, tough enough. You know, this is not a, uh, something, something for you to be, be concerned about. That's because you, this isn't a reality for you. And we have to acknowledge that in this society that sometimes words are harmful and demeaning to people in particular groups. And, and, you, that's, and you think skin color determines whether or not you understand that concept? I don't think necessarily. Or you determine religion is, is how you define that? I don't think that's what is I that said. Not a, is that, well, I, I'm, I'm asking it as a question. What's the question? Because so? I think the, the, the question is, is this understanding of human rights and dignity something that is only practiced or understood by a particular religion or a particular skin color because no, I don't not think at all. so. No, I don't, not at all. That's, that's not the point I'm making. The point, the point I'm making is that what we're talking about and what we're really wrestling with is the reality that our society is starting to reflect its diversity as different communities now move into the mainstream and are asking for the society to better represent and reflect who they are and live up to its potential. And that includes changing the names of institutions. You'll see that happening in the United States. Why are they asking in the United States to have all of these statues removed of Confederate leaders? Why are they asking for that? Because there's an acknowledgement that, you know what, this statue that we hold pride in as a dominant people is, not, is, a, is a symbol of oppression and, a, and offense to a, a good chunk of our society. And, it ref and sorry, go ahead. This comes at a cost, because I've had a school board approach me, one of their schools, as an ethicist, is Tecumseh School. Mm -hmm. Tecumseh is a venerable leader in Canadian history, yeah. but he was a slave holder. Mm -hmm. And the question is, are we now obligated to change the name of that school? Mm -hmm. As an ethicist, what's your opinion? Yeah. We have to be very, very careful. Mm -hmm. Mores and values are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. Are we going to de delegitimize yeah. things that are worth saving for political correctness? Are we going to create an environment where anything that is problematical or concerning or resilient suddenly should not be discussed. Yeah, this is the argument and they made against the charter though, right? This is the kind of argument people made against uh, enshrining certain rights in, within the Constitution. That it was an example of political correctness gone mad. That, that these ideas, these values don't need, we don't need to have this. We have a Bill of Rights in Canada. So you see, this kind of narrative and its response is consistent with typically of a, of a community that doesn't want to inc have a more inclusive rep reflection and representation in its laws, governance, and policies. And I that's think that's marring all Canadians when you say that. I, I'm, not that's trying to, really I'm not trying to mar all Canadians. I'm not trying to, to say mar people all don't want to say people don't want to. Why are you the barometer of being unpatriotic? Like, how am I unpatriotic? It's your favorite thing. Okay, it's my opinion, and I'm going to Okay, Farzana, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm Canadian. I don't Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm a Canadian woman, I'm a Muslim woman, I'm a Muslim woman of color. I have lived in Canada for 33 years, my three kids were born here, I have a granddaughter as well. Not once in 33 years have I experienced any kind of racism. Oh. I've, I've, I've told people what my name is, the response I get, oh, that's a very pretty name. I've, I've worn traditional garb, oh, well, lovely. Yeah. I have never once experienced racism in this you're country. For, you're fortunate then, because that's not the experience never of the once. vast majority so of racism. And, and if there is racism, yes, there is racism. There's, there's bigotry and racism. There are pockets of bigotry and racism everywhere. Pockets. But it's but it's benign, it's benign. Well, we're we're, well, we're not a criminal society. We are a very law-abiding country. And I think that we have lost track of that in, in, in this conversation. I just wanna say racism is not just the experience you face, it's also the systems that upheld white supremacy and upheld there are powers of working at se security jobs in airports but that, 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 doesn't, mean that, that doesn't mean anything oh really it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't oh, if there was systemic racism there Your would be no doesn't Muslim validate the given the threat of, of terrorism there were slaves that fought war. there were slaves that, that fought in the civil war 
There were people who had no rights who fought in the, in, in the First and Second World War. Does that mean that when they got back home, they were... How they is were that relevant to all because this? I'm point, talking the, about the contemporary Canadian society. There are Muslims in, in, in the... There is no job place discrimination. There oh are Muslims oh, breaking at airports. I'm surprised you haven't read studies yes. to prove that there is job I, That's all opinion. I, you have nothing I, to... Th like back the narrative is very overblown. And you do need to check your credit. And Muslims need to recognize this because this is precisely the thing that feeds that feeds the jihadi mindset. Oh, what does we're jihadi victimized. mean? What does jihadi mean? Victimized, we're victimized, so therefore we need to take revenge. This is very, very dangerous and pernicious. You're, you're and and you need to your recognize this. Your approach is to close this. your eyes. You. I'm not closing my eyes. That the people that participate in the Muslim-Jewish dialogue would agree with her. They would say that by and large, we do not believe that there is systemic racism in Canada, Jew and Muslim both. Yeah. So your organization And so what they are saying, um, if I'm understanding them, yeah. is that this is a wonderful country, that it is changing in its values. The white population that you have described as being the dominant culture is no longer so. It's very clear that the statistics are that, that whites are now a minority. Where? Uh, uh, that's not actually Where, where, where are they a minority? That's a minority in Toronto, okay. for example. You mean ethnically? Et ethnically, okay, okay. yes. But in, so, but in terms of places of power and the, yeah. privilege, where are, are whites not the, the majority? Are there, are, there, are there a lot of diversity? Is there a lot of diversity at the corporate level? The Diversity Institute and, and, at Ryerson boards, just put out a, a report that demonstrates yeah. that there's actually have, there actually hasn't been as much uh, change. And when it comes to decision making positions in boards at corporate level, we all know this. Now, systemic racism is very different than just everyday personal racism. And government uh, at all levels, uh, of all stripes, have acknowledged this. For you to say that racism is, you know, there's no racism and, you know, Canada's all, you know, honky-dory and, you know, uh, uh, apple pie haven't, and whatnot, haven't, haven't that's, an absurd, that's an okay. absurd claim. Haven't, haven't that said okay. that, but the, but the majority of people that participate in dialoguing this on a regular basis, both Jew and Muslim, are convinced that this is a healthy country, that this is a country which you is changing positively yeah. for Sorry, the good. I, I need to say this. And so you keep mentioning your organization as though it's some sort of, yeah. you know, complete Barometer representation. I'm actually also part of an interfaith Jewish Muslim law. I'm the co-leader of the Sisterhood of Salam Shalom in Toronto, the first one in Canada. And I can tell you that all the Jewish women in my group actually agree with the things yeah. we're talking about. So you can't say that your, the, the people who are part of your organization are the complete representation said, of the I, views I've of I've never of talked Jews about Muslims. complete representation. Anthony, final thoughts. I'm very troubled by the attempt to broaden this term white supremacy to mean sort of everything and all the systems out there because it is so backwards looking and doesn't reflect the way our demographic is going. When I drop my child off for school, I look at all the other kids in the playground, I have no clue what background they are. They're all blended families and so forth. The last few weddings I've been to in this part of Ontario have all been mixed race weddings. And I think, man, are these people going to be led to believe that their parents, you know, that they're born out of hatred, these two sort of opposing backgrounds that never the twain shall meet. And I, I find it a really uh, toxic approach that we were uh, sort of enshrining right now in our uh, public discourse. Blended families isn't a solution to systematic racism. Okay, that's that's love between two humans, right? But that doesn't protect them from the racism they'll f experience in the workplace. When people see the skin color, they're gonna see they're not gonna assume they're blended. They're probably gonna yes. think they're black. Okay, they're, they're, uh, like when you identify people, you identify them by on skin color. I think yeah. we need to spend more time focusing on our similarities and our differences. Just look at the audience members here. All how right. many of them are people of color, and how many of them are white? That just goes to show something, right? I, I don't, I don't are you think making it, an accusation against the audience? I'm not making an no, accusation against is, anybody. No, no. I'm just saying that look who the majority this here are in right point. now. <laughs> okay, Everybody's when we return, we'll here. hear from the audience. So don't go away. <laughs> Muslims, right? We're Muslims, we're we Muslims within this space, within this community, within we this society. Practicing our faith freely. Secular Muslims don't do that. We 
many Muslims, many please. Muslims agree with us. Oh, you generalizing, practicing you're Muslims, generalizing, practicing you're Muslims. I have asked women in hijabs; they don't feel any discrimination. They don't feel None any whatsoever. discrimination. None whatsoever. Are they Me and my shiny. How much other demographic are they? What's their class? <laughs> Have Women of color. I, I know a young girl who wears the hijab. I asked her directly. She said, "I have not faced any discrimination." Just because I know this narrative young girl. is political. <laughs> it's political. It's overblown. Just because you don't experience it doesn't invalidate the experience of someone who does. Oh, I'm okay? not saying Just people. Just because someone who doesn't experience it doesn't don't experience mean it. Race. I'm not saying no, that. A, I, I'm that saying is. the narrative is totally, totally overblown. No, no, no. So, Farzana, you know one young girl who wears a hijab yeah. who says she Not just one. I'm just talk I'm talking about other... I, I talk to a lot of people. I go and, you know... But that's the same argument people use when you want to deny It's not part part of an integrated Jewish Muslim group myself for many, many years. And, and yes, there are groups that are going to be disgruntled with the system, and there are groups that are going to be content mm -hmm. with it. That doesn't validate your opinion or mine. Our, our job here, Just because you're, you've experienced that doesn't mean that your opinion is valid in this matter. Our job here is to, is to make Canada debate. Uh, I do our best to help mm -hmm. Canada be. If we no, can it's, 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 it's a crushing, it's right? crushing debate. I know you're about to say great again, and then you pause yourself. Yeah. So <laughs> this yeah. all this is a stifling debate. This is very bad. What is happening in university campuses is horrible. And you're crushing it. And you're crushing it by. All right. Quit your yelling, guys. Oh gosh! Uh, this is what I'm saying. You're having a great old time, uh, just like it's a magic happens at the Zoomer table. Imagine if I gave you guys wine. Oh my god! <laughs> exactly. This would have been a show. Uh, would you be able to edit one of my comments? Yep. Actually, I want to remove reference to my granddaughter. Sure. I, I just yeah. said was that, that in, la in the last segment? Yeah. Please, no that's really important. I don't want you know because I do get harassed. So. Um, okay. But Prasanna, you just said you didn't feel any no, type of just, harassment or racism. Hurt. I get harassed from Islamists. People who are promoting political Islam, it's a it's a word coined by by the Muslim Brotherhood. Just sit the way. No, don't touch. Just sit the way that you're sitting. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry. Pretend this is an ear. Just don't hit it. Nice coffee. Thank you. Okay. Joe Cook. All right. Yes, okay. she's our first audience. Okay. Joe. Okay. How are you today? Fine, thank you. Very interesting debate. Okay. Have you been in the audience before? Don't worry, I'll do it. I promise. Regular? No, just one other time. I was on pensions that time. Ah. And so do you have to reserve Dom. in advance or you just show up at the door? No, we reserve in advance. Dom. Cart usually sends us a, a notice. Dom. I see. Oh, where is he? Who's, who am I talking with? Yes, they're in Mississauga. Yeah, oh. it's great. Um, can you just take note that is Kevin there? Oh, Kevin's right there. Oh, I'm editing. Kevin. Never mind. I'll talk to Kevin. Yeah. Just a reminder: we need to edit out in segment three. Uh, Farzana's reference to her granddaughter. Just remind me when we're doing okay. the editing. Okay. That's okay. all. All right. Let's go. Thirty seconds to the floor. Thirty seconds. It's not the script. Four. Welcome back. We'll hear from our audience now, starting with you. Joe, welcome to the round table. Thank you. My name is Joe Cook, and I have one question. I am just wondering if political correctness has proceeded so far and moved so far that we can no longer have intellectual, honest debates about the various issues. It's a loaded question. Who would like to tackle that one first? I'll go ahead. 
Um, I definitely think that you could have a debate, right? Political correctness, basically what it means is acknowledging the historical and the influence words have um, towards people when you're talking to them. For example, if you're talking to a black person, if you refer to them as a slave, right, that has context, right? Politically correct would be addressing them by their name, right? For example, if someone's transgender, politically correct would be addressing them by the pronouns they want you to use, right? It doesn't uh, defer or deter different types of dialogue. You can certainly have dialogue, right? But it doesn't mean that you start uh, um, using bullying tactics and start using inappropriate words and not having actual logical evidence or having a scholarly uh, debate on those um, based on the basis of that, right? Let me present a, a different answer to you, if I can. Political correctness can be a problem uh, if it means, as we heard expressed previously, um, that someone doesn't have the right to be able to construct a narrative or analyze a person's position or resiliency in the past because you're not part of that group. So if presumably I am not a Muslim, I can't comment on Islam. If I am not a black person, I can't comment on or understand the depth of black experience. That's political correctness and that's what I heard said here by one of the panelists and that's a problem for me because I'd like to think we share more of a common humanity than is being presented. And I think we all have similar values and similar needs. And the idea that we're going to suddenly find certain people that can or cannot say things is part of the problem that unites all three of the discussions that we've had. It's political incorrectness that is a threat to freedom of expression in this country. And in fact, I actually think it was Michael Maris who said uh, we may reach a point soon when only black people can teach black history in our institutions. But why can't they? They have more knowledge, they've experienced it, right? They've, what, they lived the experience. A white, can a white person, yeah, right. can no, a white person ridiculous. not adequately teach black history? I don't believe so because they, because You don't believe so? I don't believe so at all. I don't believe so. we are, yes. There you go. It's not based, a college. Based, Let me just give you an example. Let me give you an 19th example. 19th century history of Acadian black families moving to Nova Scotia. Yeah. Nobody was alive then. No, no, listen. I'm just trying to say that you wouldn't tell, uh, for example, you wouldn't let Donald Trump speak on science and say global warming isn't real when a scientist has the facts and has the evidence to prove that global warming is real. That's not the same thing. No, that is the same thing because a black person, it's their, it's their history, right? A white person will uh, take things out of context, right? Let things be, uh, cer let certain things be valid. For example, the Confederate statues, right? Right? Who are the main people saying that they should still be in existence, that they should still stand there? So when because I'm not a Muslim, here. I can't criticize Islam? Oh, no, that's no, you can criticize. Criticism, criticism is different something things. different. That's a completely different thing. You can certainly criticize. That's why I'm here. I'm listening to criticisms all the time. There are many non-Muslim Muslim scholars in universities across the world. Are, are you okay with them being professors of Muslim studies? Sorry, say that one more time. There are many non-Muslim mm -hmm. Uh, professors of Muslim studies and Islamic mm -hmm. studies in the world. Is, is the Islamic okay? study, when you talk about Isla uh, Islamic studies, are you talking about teaching the Sira, teaching the Quran, teaching the Hadith? Are you talking about They're not imams. I mean, they're professors not imams. Okay, at universities then... around the world. So okay, so, I do, so they have a critical <laughs> analysis of Islam, so that's what they're teaching, so, right? Sorry, Sophie, go sorry, ahead. Sorry, so <sighs> or they're preaching the religion because there's two different things, right? You so, want to get a non-Muslim to preach. You should or not be preaching state. Islam in a public university. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what I'm trying to say is that you shouldn't have people who aren't part of that community trying to uh, trying to teach or trying to um, influence the dialogue because they're not they're not part of the community. So they you're gonna have to lay so off thousands talk. of people. Kofi, go that's ahead. That's bigatry. That's, that's not bigotry. That's that's bigotry. That's hang on, bigotry. hang on, Kofi. I that's think. reverse bigotry and racism. There's no such thing. So, yeah. sorry. So, um, so I mean that's that's one. So, uh, so, I mean, we're here to speak objectively and honestly. So that's one particular position some people hold. I personally don't hold that view. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I personally don't hold that view. Um, but but there, are, there are some people who, to, who take that view. Um, and um, uh, the, the, to, to, the, to the comment that uh, we'll get to a point where only black people can teach black history, um, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I mean, I don't, I don't take that view. I think that... Um, there, uh, there is utility in, in good scholarship, uh, regardless of where the person comes from. Uh, I took African history at University of Toronto, and African politics, rather. My teacher was a white South African. Uh, one of, one of my, uh, my, my mentors and somebody who I've learned and benefited a lot from. So I do think, I do think, um, I do think it, it, is, it is possible for uh, a person in, uh, to, to teach a subject and, and not necessarily be from that particular uh, persuasion. But does that mean that um, we shouldn't recognize perhaps 
the sort of barriers that might be have, have been put in place in the past that may have deterred or dissuaded individuals from that particular group from assuming those roles as teachers and as, as, as the sort of leaders in those particular subject areas. We have to recognize those things. Were, were Aboriginals prevented from going to school? Were Aboriginals deterred from leaving um, the, the reserve? Were, there, there were, were some things put in their place that made it difficult for, for us to now go into a, a school and witness an Aboriginal uh, person teaching Aboriginal law and history or Aboriginal, Ab Aboriginal culture? These are things that we have to recognize. And I think that, I think that what uh, my colleague is trying to get at is that you know, we, have to, we have to try to identify those things and that we have to try to put those, uh, encourage uh, individuals from these particular backgrounds. Uh, There's uh, a recognition in, in history. of that. There's most definitely a recognition. And I would say here that I think we need to draw a distinction here. Bigotry towards people of color is different from uh, a negative opinion toward an ideology or, or a faith. People of color cannot change who they are, but pe people who hold certain views can change their views. So there, there is that difference there, mm -hmm. which, which none of us seem to recognize. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that you're talking about acknowledgement. I think that society and, and Canada has tried to rectify a lot of the wrongs of the past. I'm not saying a lot doesn't need to be done. It does need to be done. And I think there is a constant dialogue going on about what needs to be done to rectify, rectify it further. I think Farzana just hit upon a really good point. You mentioned people who were critical of the Charter back in 1982 when it first came into being. And one criticism that I think has actually proven correct is the conflation of race and religion. Religion's been put in there. People are negatively judged sometimes because of their skin color, their you know, gender, their height, all these sorts of things. Why would you, that's the way people are born. I mean, this is just, you're just an idiot if you're judging people based on those ways. Mm -hmm. Religion is an idea that you are choosing to adopt. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, religion has been held up to this great status alongside uh, the way you were born. And it is just quite frankly not. And I think one of the challenges, and to Joe's original question about you know, political correctness, I think people are being driven out of the public square for just challenging ideas, mm -hmm. which is what you know, very robust criticism of, of say, the niqab is. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
into this country. Like what? Like imposing, like imposing, yes. imposing the use. You, you gave an no, example I, I, of the it's, niqab. This is not right. about. And this I is actually, not about religious accommodation. This is a very political movement. This is not about religious accommodation. What is a Sorry, the what niqab, is a political movement? The, the niqab, the hijab. There are many niqabi women who. In fact, the majority know that it's not a it's not a religious requirement. How do you know Inside, the majority? Oh, please. You make a lot of these, these statements, stats, which I, I just know. Well, to Barbara Kaye's case, Barbara, Barbara, oh, Barbara, I mean, please. I was astonished to learn about Barbara, what Barbara Kaye had said in that clip that we aired earlier, which was, this is this face com covering is relatively new, uh, uh, post 1970. This is a very, very Iran. political Iran. movement. This is the West way of fighting Le back Lebanon to uphold. Lebanon is the first recorded case of the niqab coming in, and the reason why it was brought in Most ever. In the history of Islam. In, in the current century, the first word, I'm not talking about the Turkish period. In the modern world, Lebanon was the first example. And why did the imams in that country bring it in? Because they, Muslim women, were being targeted by the PLO and Palestinian extremists. And so to demonstrate that they were Muslim, that was the requirement. Nothing to do with religion, it had to do with security of the person. So yeah, there's an Islam. assumption that you make that the niqab-wearing women in Canada are being forced to wear the niqab. No. Many of them are. Studies Many, why have don't actually you stand up for the rights to, of those who are being so, forced? I know, as a feminist, as a feminist, I stand up for the right of a woman I have to not wear seen whatever one she one wants. One example of that, that happening every... Oh, really? And, and studies have proven. My school does no, it all the time. In, uh, what do you call it? I believe it's in Turkey where non-hijabis, hijabis, and niqabi women are all standing up against the law that's telling women to dress in a certain way. Not now you bring in Canada? You guys keep bringing you bring up other about countries and now you're saying you want to bring Canada? About so, so the how, women how, how who about are being Canadian forced, issue? why don't you talk about that? We, okay, first of all, Can niqab is a choice, okay? Hijab is a choice. A choice. It is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Hang tight. I'm not saying that at all. I'm challenging the very... You said race is not a choice. It's difficult to control. It is. The point I was going to make... The point I was... I'll explain that. Hold on. David, go ahead. The point I was trying to make is that we are interviewing some Muslim women um, that are fearful of forced suicide. Second Muslims? Yes. In your organization? No, not second. Please, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate your prejudice. We have both secular and religious Jews and Muslims in that organization. We are interviewing religious Muslim women who recognize that they are being forced into muta marriage situations. They are being forced to wear a niqab against, a hijab against their will. So can I ask you how many of these yeah. women exist? Yeah, how many do you have in your study at the moment who are being forced? We're, we're looking at six. And it's wow. very, very, and it's very, very <laughs> difficult for them. That's right, but it's very, but it's very, very difficult From for them From an academic perspective, that, I'm sorry, but six women, six, uh, can't draw three point two. But you also know there are hardly the enough can also niqab be women <laughs> wearing women in Canada to get a proper sampling size. Sorry, say that again? There are also the not enough thing. number exactly. of niqab women in Canada exactly. to get a proper but sampling but size. Because you're portraying it as the exception. You're portraying it as the rule, though. Bill 62 is a solution to a problem that doesn't, that does not exist. So I've actually never argued in favor of Bill 62. What I have yeah. argued in favor of is a parallel of what happened in 2001 when the Westboro Baptist Church tried to enter Canada and Stockwell Day, our foreign affairs minister, banned them, said, you guys aren't coming to this country because you're nut jobs. You have a ridiculous idea and we're going to ridicule it. What I'm arguing for is we should feel free that when there are practices in other religions like Christianity that we find ridiculous or intolerant, that we feel free socially to not tolerate them, to subject them to ridicule. So you can bring your ridicule. ethnocentric perspective Don't use to... Those so, crazy so, so, activist so, words. So what, what I'm saying is that... <laughs> so crazy. Your ethnocentric crazy activist words? <laughs> That's Expanding not an white supremacists. It's, an, actual, <laughs> it's an academic word. So it would be I know, based on your... that speaks to how bereft the academy is it would, You're saying that your That's on page perspective no? <laughs> on yeah. other people's religion and their culture matters more than theirs. So who decides what's ridiculous and the what's not The marketplace of ideas. Oh, oh I'm a Muslim there. woman thank, and this is my goodness. view. Okay, you know what? All right. You know what? I think, uh, Sammy, have we answered I your question? I didn't say laws, I said no, ideas. not answered. I know we can sit 24 hours because everyone <laughs> already had mindset was the review in every issue. My question was, why not we do that change to make how can we do better? How can we be togetherness more than just forcing my it's own view? Divisive. It's a reflect the society that we're living in, the multicultural society that we're living in, can right? I, can I just say one thing? Sure. So but that can happen if you can't change laws, right? Perfect. So uh, when it comes to the niqab issue, and I, I, I've heard people say this before, um, that, you know, niqab, it's, it's completely foreign. 
That's actually not true. That's, that's patently false, that it has no bearing, it has no sort of relationship to the religion. Again, that's not true. There, is some, there are some, some, some legal opinion, and in fact, the legal opinion on the niqab, the idea that the, that the face covering itself is a part of the uh, Islamic sort of dress for some women, many Muslim scholars hold that position. A minority. <clears throat> that is You're a, being disingenuous. No, no, wait, 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 please. wait, 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 let me finish. The niqab is not permitted in the Hajj, all right? Exactly. The, the, most, rec Saudi the most recognized That's, Muslim tradition. It's not a Saudi It's rule. not permitted. I need to it's wrap. So, okay, let me, let me just finish. Yeah. Last thought. When we speak about Islamic religious practices, we have to make sure that we're actually doing our homework. Are you, when you say the niqab is not allowed in the Hajj, do you know that women, some women used to cover their face during the Hajj, during the time of the Prophet? Do you know that some women, there are clear, authentic statements that seem to suggest that, in fact, they would cover their faces at that point? How does that speak to what you just mentioned? It's the not problem is, it's, it speaks to the point because the principal wife of Muhammad, who was a Jewess, did not wear a niqab. That's not true did at not, all. That's not okay. true. Okay, all right. Not, that's not true. You know what? what is not that's true. Not Agree true to disagree. Which Stay right not, there. We'll be right back with some final thoughts. and the believing women to put the veil over themselves. The, uh, scholars 30 have, seconds scholars have debated seconds. what this meant. Guys, th this is, this hold on, hold on. Yeah, I just gotta give you, there's 30 seconds each max. Okay. For what? Sorry. Final thoughts. Final thoughts. Oh, oh, okay. Can we go this way? Stop from that way? Yeah, we are. I'm starting <laughs> with Anthony, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Anthony, I had to throw you in there. We always go to the left anyway. Okay. His principal wife was Khadija. Otherwise, I throw my cameraman off. We're both scholars. Yes. It's based on a hadith, Kofi. Welcome back. We'll hear final thoughts from our panelists now, and we'll start to my left, Anthony. Uh, well, tying in M103 and Bill 62, Marissa, when it comes to, say, looking at Christianity, I think regular Canadians, North Americans, folks in the West, they have a broader frame of reference. So they don't lump all of Christianity in together. But when we're talking about Islam, we lump it all together. And I think the one thing I'd encourage everyone to do is look at the broad hues in there and exactly how there are a lot of extremist sects, Wahhabism, Salafism, that do have elements around the world. Those elements are coming to Canada. And what role do they play in this conversation? This sort of black and white thing, it isn't working. Mm. Well, we're talking about accommodation, and I think that uh, the accommodation needs to be a two-way stream. And I think that Canadian society is accommodating quite a bit. In fact, I think it's accommodating intolerance in many, many ways. And I think that those who are promoting intolerance, they are the ones who need to accommodate. And they are the ones who need to develop this uh, sort of feeling of camaraderie b between them and, and, and people of other faiths and religious communities and ethnic communities. I'm optimistic that we are forging together uh, as people of different color and different religion and different political perspectives to create a more inclusive and open and just Canadian society. But I worry very, very much that a bill such as 103 um, is reflective of a shrinking of our freedom of expression. And I will do everything I can to try and work together with other Canadians in dialogue and discussion to make sure that the unequal and pejorative and dangerous concepts inherent in Bill 103 are defeated and never see um, the light of legislation. All right, so I, you, I actually came on this panel because I'm an Akabi woman to spell, uh, speak on Bill 62. And what I just want to say is that one of the main things, my main arguments I heard was that it has backward associations or that it represents terrorist organizations, et cetera. Um, actually, when you actually talk to an Akabi woman, Kathleen Wayne, most of the people, when she was, she was in the Thorncliffe writing, most of the people that were behind her were Nakabi women. And she's an openly gay woman, right? Um, many people think I'm a homophobe just because I cover or wear niqab. Actually, I don't think my religion preaches hate, right? I don't uh, believe my religion tells me to um, be on this life just to hate people and tell them, oh, they should be stoned to death because their sexuality is this, 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 or because they're transgender, they're this, this, this. I actually believe everyone has equal rights here in Canada. I believe every person should be accommodated and should feel free to express their religion, to feel free to be uh, themselves to their true, uh, truest potential, right? By inhibiting me from wearing the niqab, you're going to start inhibiting 
sticks from wearing their turbans or Christians from wearing their veils, right? The, or tell nuns that they can't go to the nunnery anymore because that they, we're living in a secular society. They shouldn't go practice what they want to believe in, right? It comes to, it, when you target one thing, you're gonna start targeting everything else. And then when you start saying that, oh, it's a slippery slope, it is a slippery slope for certain instances. But for myself and my existence here in Canada, I believe that accommodating people and letting them wear the niqab and letting them express themselves to the fullest potential that they have actually helps the Canadian Fabric Society to move forward. And as one of the gentlemen said, to become a staple in, in this world to let people say, hey, we should follow that example. We should all live together and we shouldn't use our differences to um, you know, divide each other, right? Instead, we should come together so that we can hold others accountable that try to um, divide the society and try to make us um, hate each other because that's what happened when we see um, people going into churches and mosques and killing each other. So first of all, I want to thank every, everybody here for uh, participating and uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, so uh, as I mentioned uh, very early on, um, so I don't come from the Muslim uh, tradition. My, my family is Christian. In fact, my, my, mother's a, my mother, my father's a pastor and my mother, she's also an ordained minister as well. So I came to Islam freely of my own will over six years ago. And I'll tell you, and I think this is, a, this is instructive for this conversation and for many conversations that are going to happen. I've met many, many Muslims in that time, many of whom know nothing of their own religion, many of whom wear niqab, many of whom don't wear niqab, many of whom pray, and they know absolutely nothing about their religion. They don't know what Salafism means. They don't know what Wahhabism means. But at the same time, you don't know, there are many critics of Islam that don't know anything about their religion as well. And that becomes patently clear when they start speaking about majority of scholars or uh, the, the hijab or the, what does this mean? Many of them don't even speak Arabic or haven't even taken the time to look into classical books of Islam. And my problem is that when we have, when we're operating from a position of ignorance, there's so much ignorance about Islam. People really have no conception of idea or idea about this 1400 year tradition that has as diversity of views and positions as we find in the common law. It's a, it's a religion that is a, that is a literate based religion that is a legalistic religion. And the, the views are, are wide ranging and vast. Some are, some are on the left, some are on the right. And my, the vast majority of people uh, don't even take the time, unfortunately, to spend time learning more about it. If we really want to dispel the phobia that's growing around Islam, we have to take time to actually genuinely go and learn this religion uh, from proper sources and not use our own biases and prejudices or even our own bad experiences in our lifetimes to prejudge and predetermine what this religion means and what people practicing it uh, are, are, are attempting to do. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, uh, I'd just like to say that um, criticisms of Motion 103, which is a motion and not a bill, um, and discussions around Bill 62, they all kind of stem from this Islamophobia industry, which is an irrational fear of Muslims. And it stems from it and it also feeds it, which then leads to anti-Muslim hate, bigotry, violence, which has been seen. We're coming up to the one year anniversary of, you know, a, a white Quebecois walking into a mosque and trying to kill more, but in the end killing six Muslim men worshipping. Now that was the uh, the biggest mass shooting in Canadian history and the only time a house of worship uh, was targeted and you know it was it was Muslims so um, what I'd like to say also is that let's not forget the gender element to this bill 62 sexualizes women uh, whether you're putting the niqab on a woman, the hijab on a woman, or you're removing it, you're policing a woman's body. And from a feminist perspective, I don't think uh, that the government has a place in the closet of women, and women should have the right to choose what they want to wear, what not to wear. And something like Bill 62, the criticisms criticisms around Motion 103, they once again just put a spotlight on this community, the Muslim community, which perpetuates that, furthers that irrational fear that leads to more hate crimes and violence against this community. So we need to really think hard about, you know, how we approach these issues. All right. Well, thank you to my panelists and to our audience in studio and at home for watching. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.